Good morning. Good morning. Riveting lecture, important topic. So, um, first of all, and I didn't actually make slides on this, the anatomy of the venous system, there are three um, anatomic divisions of the venous system. There's the deep veins, which are the ones that are paired with your named arteries. There are the superficial veins, which are the ones that lie superficial to your named arteries. And there are the perforators that connect the two. The only ones that are of medical significance to the person as a whole and not just to the local area are the deep veins. Um, the way you know that it's a deep vein is it has a name that sounds like one of the arteries that you already know. Um, one caveat to this, and anybody who's scrubbed with me on the groin case knows I like to ask <coughs> this. So the artery, the vein that runs with the common femoral artery or is, anyone? Common femoral vein, okay. And the vein that runs with the profunda femoris artery is the deep femoral vein or profunda vein. And the vein that runs with the superficial femoral artery is anybody? Well, the other two were easy. The vein that runs alongside the superficial femoral artery is wrong. It's the femoral vein. It used to be called the superficial femoral vein, and if you find an old enough book, it'll be called that. Why did they change it? This, this really is just, it, the body didn't change. This is clinicians and anatomists got together and said, guys, we should change this name. Why did they change the name? The femoral vein instead of superficial femoral vein. It's actually a deep vein. And why does that matter? Are the only ones that are yeah, see? Yeah, those. So, because if your ER doctor in Podunk, Louisiana, gets an ultrasound and it says that there's a thrombosis of the superficial femoral vein, they say, whew, I thought they had a DVT. They don't. They must be fine. And they'll send them out. And a clot in the superficial femoral vein is a DVT and needs to be treated as such. So that's why they changed it, so that none of the deep veins have the word superficial in the title. Avoid confusion for people who don't actually listen to my lecture. Okay, so now then, what did I prepare for us? Uh, venous insufficiency, venous stasis, varicose veins. Um, this is the CEAP classification. Uh, this is like the TMN of varicose veins, except not as important because it's not cancer. Um, the clinical classification, pretty much you go from asymptomatic all the way up to C4 is your stasis dermatitis, C5 is a healed ulcer, C6 is an active ulcer. Uh, those are the ones who are indicated for treatment if you have skin changes or ulceration. Um, okay. Yes, okay. Uh, etiologic classification, virtually nobody really, unless you're doing pediatric venous work or something like that, it's usually it's primary. Secondary is your post thrombotic syndrome. So these are people who had a DVT, DVT went away, and now their veins don't work anymore because their valves got obliterated by the DVT. Somebody thought it was important, it's in the classification, but for the most part, you're working with primary. Uh, anatomic, that's what we were just talking about, superficial deep or perforator. So besides having a clot, you can have reflux in the superficial deep or perforator system. Uh, that's going to determine what you can and cannot do to fix it. And then uh, the P is, is it reflux, um, which is, who wants to define reflux in a vein for me? Sure. So your veins have valves that prevent blood from going backward back to your feet. Yes. And your muscles contract to help push blood out of the vein, the valves stop them from coming back down. When you have 
have reflux valves are working correctly. So like the reflux through the valves. Okay. Go the wrong direction. Yes. All right, and then you can have obstruction, which is pretty self-explanatory. You can have mixed, or you can have undefined. So the treatment algorithm for most of this is compression, 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 compression. So the first line treatment for virtually all venous stasis, varicose veins, etc., is all together now? Compression. All right, I had to give a lecture on this in <coughs> fellowship on the surgical treatment, and I had to take this slide and slash out every time they said compression and said we're not going to talk about compression. Um, so the, the mainstay of treatment for all of your venous stasis disease is compression. If your patient refuses to wear compression, then nothing else that you do is going to work. You have to let them know that. So you can vein strip, you can do sclerotherapy, you can do all these, if they don't work compression, nothing's going to work. So. It really does work because even, I guess, long surgery, long-standing days, when we have our, some calf pain with some mild limitation of some official veins and tight compression socks do work. Yeah. So, uh, surgical treatment of venous valve incompetence. Um, so ligation and stripping is the old school way. It's really neat surgery. You cut down on the saphenofemoral junction. You cut down on the saphenous vein down at the ankle. You run a cord up the saphenous vein, put a little cap on it so that it catches everything, and you pull it like you're starting a lawnmower, and then you just hold pressure down the whole leg. Um, don't do a lot of that anymore because it's a more morbid procedure than the ablation procedures. Um, but it still has its place. Um, stab phlebectomy, if you've got a varicose vein, you can literally stab the leg on top of where that is and pull it out and ligate it to actually just excise that particular vein. It doesn't help any of the underlying disease, it just removes the pathologic vein. Um, and then ablation is the mainstay of venous reflux nowadays. You can do RFA, you can do laser, they've got these uh, glue guns now that'll work for it. Basically, for all of these, what you're doing is you're preventing blood from refluxing down either the, sap the greater saphenous or the lesser saphenous vein. And you're forcing the venous drainage of the leg to go into the deep system. Uh, for perforators, you can ablate them. It's more difficult. You can um, foam sclerotherapy. If you can get right into it, you can inject some foam. Uh, the SEPS procedure is a, it's kind of the old school. Again, it's um, subfascial endoscopic perforator surgery. Think you're taking your um, <coughs> Laparoscopic camera, you're putting it into the subfascial space of the lower leg, insufflating the leg, and you're seeing those perforator veins hang down, you're just clipping those. Uh, for deep reflux, there are three people in the country who do this stuff. Um, one of them's in Jackson, Mississippi. I'm not one of them. Um, so there are these great chapters in Rutherford's about how to do all this. Really, you just send them to somebody who does this. A lot of this for deep reflux, the treatment is worse than the disease at this point because the mainstay of treatment is compression. So if you can wear a compression stocking or you can harvest veins out of somebody's axilla, put them in their groin and hope that the valve works and get maybe a 10 or 20% decrease in their leg swelling, so that's, but there's a guy in Jackson who, if you've got somebody, he's the guru who writes the chapters. If you're three hours away from the world expert, don't be arrogant. Um, so this is for ligation and stripping. Young vascular surgeons used to have to learn the names of all the different branches of the saphenofemoral junction. I'm not one of them. Um, 
but you just thread this catheter all the way up and you rip the vein out. Um, for the ablation, we pretty much talked about this. You're just cauterizing the inside of the vein, uh, either radio frequency or laser or something, so that the vein no longer blood can't go up, blood can't go down, you've eliminated your reflux. Um, your treatment begins two centimeters distal to the saphenofemoral junction because the saphenous vein is what kind of vein? Okay, and the femoral vein is what kind of vein? Okay, so if you cauterize the saphenous vein, it is okay. And if that cautery injury extends into the femoral vein, it is not okay. What's it called? DVT. Um, also, you do this with the called tumescence. Pretty much, you just inflate their leg with a lidocaine solution so that you don't burn their skin whenever you burn the vein. Um, Post-op compression, they have to walk because the major risk of any of the ablative procedures is DVT. Uh, and then we're checking a duplex within 72 hours to check for DVT. Um, that's about that. So this is what they call E-HIT. I forget exactly what that stands for, but it's DVT after saphenous ablation. And they went through and they studied where is it, how far in does it go, and what do you need to do. So if your thrombus ends proximal to two centimeters proximal to the saphenofemoral junction, then hooray, you did a great job, don't need to worry about it. If you come past, this is your epigastric vein, still, you're a little close, but you know, you did a great job, no treatment. If you're flush, right here, with the saphenofemoral junction, uh, there's some variability with that. You can either anticoagulate or not. If it starts to bulge into the femoral vein, then you've got a DVT, although a very small one. For these, anticoagulate and surveil until that regresses. You don't have to do long term. Um, once it starts to include the side walls on either side, once again, anticoagulate until it regresses. If it goes all the way across the vein, then you've got a, a grown-up DVT, and then you actually have to treat it for three months. It's considered a provoked DVT. So that's if you all see in the clinic any of the follow-up venous ablations, and we're look, that's what we're looking for when we get those three-day three DVT studies. Um, if you can't do ablation, and these are the various um, contraindications to ablation, then you can do uh, the vein stripping. Uh, acute superficial thrombophlebitis is one of the contraindications to doing your RFA or your uh, laser, so that's one indication for doing your open vein stripping. Deep reflux. We kind of mentioned this on that earlier slide. Um, so first of all, with venous disease, you treat the easy stuff first. So if you've got mixed, deep, and superficial reflux, you treat all the superficial, then you treat all the perforator, and then you worry about the deep system. Um, about one third of, let's see, one third of deep venous incompetence and 70% of your post thrombotic syndrome will have recurrence of ulcers. And then look at your iliac veins. Look for outflow venous disease instead of in the leg venous disease. Uh, this is, you can do your iliac vein stenting and have resolution of symptoms in 60%. So after you've treated superficial reflux, you've treated perforator reflux, you've treated outflow occlusion, then most of your patients are going to have if not resolution, then at least improvement of their symptoms to the point that you don't have to go do valve transplants or anything like that. So treat the easy stuff first, and then if you've got anything left, 
then you can talk about the ridiculous things. Um, Mayferner syndrome. Anyone know what Mayferner syndrome is? Connor. Yes. What is it in words? The right iliac, the right common iliac artery compresses the left common iliac vein. Yes. So if you have varicosities or venous stasis disease that is on the left and not on the right, this is a common etiology in a young person who hasn't had a DVT. The treatment for this is? Yes. Okay, that's very easy. Um, that's about it. Post-thrombotic syndrome, if you occlude all your iliac veins, you can stent those back open and we kind of went over that. All right, thrombophlebitis. Is inflammation and thrombosis of a superficial vein. Very specifically, this is not a DVT. Uh, your buzzword for this, you're going to see in your question stems, is the palpable cord. <coughs> palpable cord is superficial thrombophlebitis if it's on a test. Uh, the main thing you need to do if you have superficial thrombophlebitis is rule out underlying DVT. So if you've got a clot in the cephalic vein and it's extending all the way up here, could extend into your subclavian vein, then your treatment algorithm is completely different because then you've got a DVT. DVT is important, superficial thrombophlebitis is not. Uh, the treatment for superficial thrombophlebitis is NSAIDs and warm compresses. You can do that at home. Um, caveats to that, superlative thrombophlebitis. It's a pussed out vein, it's an abscess of the vein. Um, you need to IND it or do a vein excision or pretty much it's an abscess. You treat it like an abscess, take out all the infected material. Because it's a vein, it may bleed at you and you may have to ligate proximally and distally, but once your vein develops pus in it, it's got to come out. Um, a couple of eponyms. Uh, Mondor's disease is... Um, giving you all the answers, so I can't really quiz you on this. Thrombophlebitis of the breast is Mondor's disease. That's associated with breast cancer. It's associated with hypercoagulable states. It's associated with your different vasculopathies. The other one is Trousseau syndrome, uh, which is your recurrent migratory thrombophlebitis. So you had superficial thrombophlebitis on one arm, then it gets better, it goes to the other arm, it goes to a different part on the leg. That's a... Um, perineoplastic syndrome uh, and suspicious for underlying adenocarcinoma. So follow up on that page. Uh, the Mondo's disease is a oral board scenario. It starts like that and stems into full breast cancer. Okay. So those are, are eponyms that you also be familiar with. Any questions on the very important clinical entity of superficial thrombophlebitis? If you go into vascular surgery, you will get consults that says, this patient has a clot in their cephalic vein. They have a DV, or they'll say they have a DVT in their cephalic vein. What do I need to do? And the answer to that is, yes, NSAIDs, warm compresses, and leave me alone. Um, but you have to make sure that they're calling you based on an ultrasound, because the ultrasound will have already ruled out an associated DVT. The most important thing with superficial thrombophlebitis is rule out underlying disease. The disease entity itself is not clinically significant unless you get to the point that it's an abscess and then you have to drain it. Okay, venous thromboembolism, DVT and PE. Um, medical management. This is pretty straightforward. I could give this to medicine grand rounds as well. Anticoagulation if not contraindicated. So you're a vascular surgeon and you get consulted for a DVT. The answer is anticoagulate the patient. Okay, if they can't be anticoagulated, then you fit into your indications for an IVC filter. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, the kind of caveats with DVTs is there's a difference between a provoked and an unprovoked DVT. The initial management is anticoagulation. The difference is the duration. 
So a provoked <laughs> DVT gets three months after the provoking situation is relieved. Um, and one thing I didn't put a slide in on is the catheter associated DVTs. That is, I got a consult for that yesterday. Um, so catheter associated DVT, you've got a patient with a port cath or a pick line or something like that, and they've got a clot around it. The answer to that is anticoagulate. And then the next question is, is the line necessary and still functioning? So you've got a cancer patient, they've got a port cath, they're still undergoing chemotherapy, leave the line in. You don't have to pull the line, you anticoagulate them. Then once they're done with the line, you remove the line and you anticoagulate for three months after the line's been removed because that's your provoking incident is the presence of the line. And you anticoagulate for three months after the provoking incident is done. You have a patient who took a train ride across the U.S., they come back with a DVT, they get anticoagulated for three months after they stop taking long train rides. Um, if they're immobilized because they've got a rod in their femur, then it's once they're ambulatory again. Okay. Uh, unprovoked DVT, if you have no reason why this patient got a DVT, they're considered hypercoagulable, they get anticoagulated for life. Um, the other caveat is patients who have cancer. Uh, and this is one that in clinical practice we usually forget about um, because we like to put people on the new oral anticoagulants because you don't have to monitor them, you don't have to set up the social work. Patients with cancer, the official recommendation coming out of the ACCP is that they get Lovenox or they get low molecular weight heparin. Um, with cancer, with chemotherapy, your oral absorption and bioavailability of your oral agents is going to be altered. And so patients who have cancer, they should be treated with uh, sub-Q low molecular weight heparin and not um, oral agents. Is that active cancer or is that pre-focused Active. I don't think the the um, guidelines differentiate, but if you've resected somebody and you've declared them cancer free, then they're cancer free. So. So in the situation you mentioned about the port on chemo and anticoagulating for three months once it's removed, but if the patient had cancer but wasn't in remission. That those guys are getting Lovenox. Because if they had a port and they're still being treated for it, then that's. This isn't just unprovoked. Any DVT in a cancer patient is, should be treated with low molecular weight heparin because um, like you're, especially Coumadin, if you're getting chemotherapy, your Coumadin metabolism is going to be so unpredictable that you're going to be INR of 6 one day and 0.7 the next day and you just can't predict it. So your low molecular weight heparin is more predictable, it's more readily bioavailable. Um, and so you do that, and that way you don't have to fool with, are they puking their guts up because of chemo? Is their pancreatic cancer keeping them from absorbing anything? All of that kind of stuff. All right. Um, massive versus submassive PE. Um, this is one of the, so a PE associated with instability, so hypotension code, uh, that's a massive PE. Um, that is, needs to be, if they can tolerate the operation, then the traditional teaching on that is your open um, pulmonary artery thrombectomy. Usually, if they're sick enough to need the surgery, they're not sick enough to, they're not well enough to survive the surgery. That's why you don't see many of those procedures being done. The submassive PE. That's a patient who is hemodynamically stable, but they have right heart strain or they have pulmonary hypertension. Uh, these are typically echo findings. Uh, sometimes you can see them on a CTA, um, but when you're getting called and somebody has a PE and they have a saddle PE or they have a large segmental PE, the next diagnostic step once you've diagnosed a PE is you need an echo, you need to determine if there's right heart strain. Because if there is right heart strain, then you need to 
either do uh, your open surgical thrombectomy if you don't have the capability of doing thrombolysis, or you can do catheter-directed thrombolysis of the pulmonary arteries to clear out and dissolve that clot to then relieve the right heart strain. Because these are patients who are either going to become unstable, or if they don't become unstable, they will lifelong have pulmonary hypertension because of this, and will end up on a pulmonary cripple because you left it alone. So large PEs, you need to get an echo, and that's your next diagnostic step to determine do you need to get this clot out or not. And if there isn't, right? If there's not right heart strain. The same duration as a regular DVT? Yep. The nice thing, I will say, the nice thing about venous disease, um, and even the reflux and stuff is that there are a great, there are like 30 pages, evidence-based guidelines for all of venous disease. The ACCP has the DVT guides, the VTE guides, the, the um, venous stasis guides, the venous ulceration guides. And so there is, you can just, if you're ever in doubt, you can just Google ACCP whatever guidelines and there's a whole thing and you can find the very specific scenario that you're in it's all spelled out and it's got the level 1c evidence and what have you on that so venous disease because so many different specialties are involved with it they've got multidisciplinary evidence-based guidelines out there so when in doubt you can the original version of these talks that i gave in fellowship actually had the guidelines pulled in for all these different things um, venous disease is very well defined as to what the actual guideline is. Which then makes it very frustrating when you get a phone call from someone and you can just say, well, the guideline says to do this, so that's my recommendation. Anyway, um, IVC filters, um, there are four different types. Several of them don't exist. Some of these are just theoretical or are no longer in use. Permanent filter is the Greenfield filter. You put it in, it stays for life. Pretty self-explanatory. The temporary filter is no longer available to the US, in the U.S. And it was pretty much one that was left on a tether. And so then whenever, if you had a bedridden patient, you can leave the filter in. Whenever they're able to be ambulatory, you can pull it out. Don't use those anymore. There's a convertible filter, which actually, since this talk was originally made there is now one that's available in the u.s um what those are is it's a, a venous stent with a filter as part of it that has a absorbable suture as part of the contraption so it's got like a, a pds suture that's holding it into the umbrella shape and after several months that pds suture is going to dissolve and then it's going to flop open and become a venous stent and no longer have the, the filter portion of that. So that should cut down on your cable occlusions. My personal worry is if you've got a basket full of clot and all of a sudden it burst open, isn't that just a mess? They say it's not. I don't know. I have not yet used one of these. There's only one of them on the market, and I don't know many people who are using them now. Uh, what you see a lot of are the retrievable, retrievable filters. These are ones that don't have quite as aggressive of barbs as the permanent filters do, and they have a hook on the end, and you can snare it and you can pull it out. So if they were bedridden and they couldn't be anticoagulated and now they're ambulatory, you go back in, you snare this, and take it out. Um, that's what they look at, look like. This is retrievable because it's got a hook at the top. To place them, I think that's part of its, uh, well, in vascular surgery, what we call a pin and pull system. Um, so they're on a pusher that's inside of a sheath. And so you position the whole thing right where you want to be, which is going to be right where. Connor, you've answered everything, so let's go. Where do you want your IVC filter? Yes, so you want to find out where your renal veins are. You want to be right below your renal veins. 
you're going to place the delivery system right below the renal veins and everything in your body is going to tell you to hold the sheath and push the pusher and that's wrong and that this is a lot of things in vascular surgery though what you're doing is you're pinning the pusher down and you're pulling the sheath back and that deploys your filter exactly where it is that you placed it so you put it in where you want it and you pull back and you leave the pusher in place so that's it's pretty simple um, everybody's seen these commercials um, there are complications associated with DVT filters there actually was one particular IVC filter that had a complication rate that was higher than the others it would migrate uh, it's no longer on the market the ones that are made by that company have now been modified so you can assure your patients if you're putting the IVC filter in that the one that the commercials for is not the one that you're going to put in them um, and so but um, there are absolutely con uh, complications to these there are contraindications to them and so you don't want to willy-nilly put these in there was a time when everybody got an IVC filter because you could and that's not the case because now we're acutely aware of the bad things that can happen um, I didn't put a lot of pictures in the bad things that can happen but they're great um, indications for IVC filter these are the uh, evidence-based if you have a documented DVD or PE and you have a contraindication to anticoagulation then you get an IVC filter if you have a DVT or a PE and you've had a complication of anticoagulation so we start you on a heparin drip and you have a GI bleed then you can get an IVC filter if you've been anticoagulated and continue to throw PEs then you get an IVC filter and if for some reason you can't reach a therapeutic anticoagulated state then you can get an IVC filter that's if you're talking about absolute indica indications for IVC filters that's it there's a lot of relative indications that are out there but these are the the actual if you put in an IVC filter based on these nobody almost nobody will argue with you because these are your evidence-based guidelines these are your relative ones um, so you've got somebody who just won't take their Coumadin um, you've got a really threatening looking clot that you want to get out of the way uh, renal cell carcinoma because those will extend up the cava um, while you're doing a venous thrombolysis some people will put a cable filter in so that anything that breaks off while they're doing it and they pull it out at the end um, and then you've got these well they've got a DVT and their lungs are really bad and so if they do throw a PE then they're not going to tolerate it well that's a that's a soft call uh, that's a clinician's choice that's a you've got to weigh your your risk and benefits of that a lot of times you'll have someone else whose patient this is come to you and say I really don't want this patient to get a PE because their lungs are bad can you put a filter in and you've got to have an honest conversation with the patient about what to expect with that before you just put one in um, because the person who's asking you to put the filter in they're not the one who's dealing with those complications you are um, so um, and then these are the even softer calls uh, trauma bariatric surgery orthopedic surgery malignancy and general surgery so trauma patients risk of DVT without any prophylactics prophylaxis up to 50 percent PE up to 30 percent uh, the current guidelines don't support filter placement for specific for trauma uh, there's no level one evidence for or against them there is some lower level evidence for your high risk trauma patients who have your head injury plus they're immobile because of long bone or spinal injury um, so you can put a retrievable filter in um, and then take it out once they're mobile again one of the major problems with putting filters in trauma patients is that they don't come back to get their filters removed um, which is one of the the argument for this is you put it in while they're at risk 
you take it out once they're not at risk. Um, but if they don't come in and get it taken out, then they continue to be at risk of complications from the filter instead. Yes, Connor. I was just interested if you had any like emerging evidence about angel catheters or anything you do about. Don't know what that is. The, they're the central lines that you put ephemerally that have a filter on the end of them, and then whenever you take the central line out, the filter comes with it. Never heard of it. Um, that kind of falls under these um, temporary filters, but I, I'm not aware of that existing, so that's kind of neat. <coughs> yes? We use 30 uh, milligrams of Lovinox DID, mm -hmm. and sometimes we run into the neurosurgery colleagues in trauma patients. They, they worry because of the head injuries. What's your take on that? That's... <coughs> So there, there's low-level evidence for that when you have head when you have patients with head bleeds that are immobile for another reason as well, um, then it's a soft call, but it, it's doable. Uh, that's kind of you have a conversation with your trauma surgeon about how long do you expect them to be immobile, how long until it's safe for them to be anticoagulated. Uh, can they just have SCDs and cover them until they're able to be anticoagulated? Um, but if they've got a larger head bleed and they're not going to be safe to be anticoagulated for some time, then it's reasonable. Low level evidence. Okay. Uh, bariatric surgery, um, it's done because these patients are at high risk for DVT and PE and they're immobile just by the way that they are. Um, we don't do a lot of bariatric surgery. Um, once again, the, the kind of the idea is if you put a removable filter in and then you can go out and get it, then uh, usually no harm, no foul, and you've protected them during their vulnerable period. Uh, orthopedic surgery, the evidence doesn't pan out for that. These patients should just get chemical prophylaxis. Um, patients with cancer. So this is not surgical patients with cancer. This is the, you've got somebody with stage four cancer and they've developed a DVT and um, you can place a filter if they have contraindication to anticoagulation. Um, they fit one of your evidence-based ones. You can put one in a cancer patient. If they've got a limited life expectancy already, they've got advanced disease, then you don't go in and do this. It's, it's one of those sometimes a PE is not a bad way to go and don't put these people through unnecessary complications. Um, high risk general surgery patients should be anticoagulated. Um, perioperatively, we don't put filters in for general surgery. Um, however, if they have your post-op DVT and they're contraindicated to full anticoagulation, then you fall back on your evidence-based guideline for putting the filter in. Uh, pregnancy, your indications are the same during pregnancy as they are when you're not pregnant, but your positioning is going to be different because your infrarenal cava is going to be compressed by the gravid uterus and you don't want your filter struts to end up in the uterus. So consider um, going super renal with these if you do have to place one during pregnancy. Um, contraindications, caval abnormality, caval compression. Um, I mean, those are pretty self-explanatory. There are a lot of caval variations. You can have duplicate cavas. Um, just shoot a venogram, make sure you're putting it where you think you're going to put it before you put it in. Um, that's it. Questions? Okay.